हेलो एवरीवन दिस इज तालिब हुसैन खान एंड टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू सी द कंसेप्ट ऑफ ऑफिस ऑफ गवर्नर व्हेन वी टॉक अबाउट दिस कंसेप्ट ऑफ ऑफिस ऑफ गवर्नर देयर आर सर्टेन थिंग्स व्हिच ऑटोमेटिकली कम्स इनटू आवर माइंड बट द पॉइंट इज व्हेन वी टॉक अबाउट दीस टाइप्स ऑफ कंसेप्ट्स द फर्स्ट थिंग व्हिच वी नीड टू अंडरस्टैंड इज व्हाई आर वी गोइंग थ्रू दीस कंसेप्ट्स एंड व्हेन वी टॉक अबाउट दीस कंसेप्ट्स ऑटोमेटिकली यूपीएससी कम्स इनटू एग्जिस्टेंस when we talk about this concept of upsc you will see that on a regular basis we have been seeing ample question from this section of office of governor there are various dimensions associated with this and if you see these dimensions you will see that in the last 10 years we have seen almost 4 to 5 questions from this section in prelims examination apart from its importance in mains examination which we will see in the further classes now the point is when you talk about this structure of governor <coughs> you will see that this structure of governor gets us with a lot of questions in examination and when you see these questions you will automatically be able to understand the dimensions which we need to cover for example just see this question which was asked in upsc 2019 prelims examination if you see this question you will see that upsc mainly focused on the various commissions which had suggested various uh, uh, structures associated with this office of governor for example if you see this either it be the sarkariya commission or it be the national commission to review the working of constitution or it be the arc is that is the first administrative reforms commission or the second arc let it be this raja manar commission or any other commission or committee you will see that various commissions and committees have suggested various things associated with this office of governor we will see all these things in the classes but at first we need to understand that what we need to see in the context because if you see, if you are able to understand the questions which have been asked in examination you will automatically be able to understand that in which direction we need to go unless and until you are clear with the direction the whole content which we have been seeing in the market will become meaningless for you so you will see this question and you will automatically be able to understand that what we need to cover in this dimension again if you move forward <clears throat> into this concept you will see that there was a question in 2018 also and if you talk about this question it was with reference to article 361 of indian constitution which gives us some sort of privileges with reference to this structure of office of governor along with this there was another statement with reference to emoluments and allowances associated with this office of governor mainly second schedule of the constitution now the point is if you talk about these dimensions again we are able to understand from this very question that what we need to cover in the structure of office of cover if you keep on moving with reference to these questions you will see that we have been seeing a lot of question with reference to this structure like what are the discretionary powers associated with this structure of governor if you go through article 163 of indian constitution you will see that it specifies about the powers of the governor along with having this aid and advice from the council of ministers it also is, comes up with the concept of discretionary powers and this term discretionary power is specified in the article itself either it be the draft article 143 of indian constitution or it be the original constitution article 163 of uh, indian constitution in both the dimensions that is in the draft that is 143 as well as in the a uh, constitution under article 163 you will see the term discretionary and you have to understand this relationship with reference to this government of india act 1935 also again if you move forward into this question you will see that we have been seeing a lot of question associated with this structure of the office of governor if you see these questions we are not here to answer these questions so i'm just giving a glimpse of these questions so that you can understand that what we need to cover if you move forward into this concept you will see that on a regular basis we have been seeing this question on office of governor every year in examination if you see the questions of examination you will see that either you will get a question from the president or the governor why am i relating this structure of president from the governor you will also understand with the passage of time now the point is when you talk about this whole concept of office of governor we need to understand that what are we going to cover in this subsequent uh, time period which we are using here So if we talk about this we have to see the structure of origin of the structure of governor how this structure of governor originated in india and we have to see the historical perspective associated with this also again if you move forward into this concept we have to understand that what is the process of appointment the constituent assembly debates are very important aspect associated with this structure because if you see this debates associated with the structure of the governor you will automatically be able to uh, understand that what are the dimensions what were the dimensions raised at that time and what are the dimensions which we need to see at the present in the present context if you see we have to understand the multifaceted role of the office of governor along with this we have to see various judgments associated with this either it be the sr bomai case or it be the other cases associated with this 
we have to understand that what are the dimensions associated with this with reference to this structure of governor. We have to see that what are the current issues which we have been seeing and due to which we have been, <coughs> we have been seeing this issue of governor in news again and again. Along with all these things, we have to understand that what needs to be done. And here in the section of what needs to be done, we can see various suggestions by different committees and commissions. And along with that, we have to see some facts. We cannot cover each and every concept associated with this concept of office of governor. So we will also see at the end that what else we need to do with reference to the system. If you move forward into this concept, we have to understand this structure of origin of the office of governor. And this can be related from this 1858 Act, an Act for Better Government of India. Now the point is, this structure of office of governor did not originate from here. This is not the origin point. You have to understand that this office of governor was there in the Mughal period also. If you see the Mughal period, there also we had the structure of governors. And when the Britishers came to India, then from initial phase till the phase of 1858 also there was this office of governor. But I am specifically specifying this date 1858 because if you see the structure of evolution of the constitution of India and evolution of the British rule in India, you will see that the Britishers, Britishers started this process of centralization of power from 1773. And in 1833, this centralization of power was at its peak. Uh, was at it, was at its peak. But after 1857, we started seeing the context, the concept in the different manner. In 1858 came the structure of what we call as an act for better government of India. Actually, this act was not with reference to India. It was mainly with reference to how Britishers are governing India. And that is why in 1858, East India Company was removed and the whole administration came in the hands of the British Crown. And British Crown directly started seeing the administration. And at this level, we saw that the office of governor started having its importance again. Before this phase also, there was this structure of office of governor. But through this 1833, all the powers of the governor was taken up and all the power came in the hands of Governor General of India. That is why I am specifying this 1858. You will see that from here, that is from 1858 onwards, this governor started functioning under the supervision of the British Crown as well as the Governor General of India and the Viceroy of India. Now the point is from here onwards, 1858 onwards, we started seeing this evolution and you will see that through this Indian Council Act of 1868, we also came up with this concept of devolution of power or we can also understand it as decentralization of power. Now the point is, if you could see the concept of decentralization of power, the concept of centralization which was at its peak in 1833, started seeing this decentralization. And here again, some power started coming in the hands of the governors. This kept on improving and finally, you will see that through this Government of India Act 1935, or it can also be known as the Constitution of India 1935. From here onwards, if you see the concept from this constitution of India 1935, we can see that here the concept of collective responsibility came into existence. Why am I specifying this collective responsibility? If you see the concept of collective responsibility, it will automatically lead you to have this parliamentary form of government. And if you see this parliamentary form of government, you have to understand that in parliamentary form of government, we need to have the head of the state as well as the head of the government. If you want to have this structure of head of the state, you need to have this structure of governor or the president. India opted for this parliamentary form of government at both the levels. At both the levels in the sense that it opted for this parliamentary form of government at the union level as well as the provincial level. And that is why at the union level we have the president of India and in the provincial level we have the office of governor. Provincial level, provinces. Actually if you see the term provinces, you have to understand the meaning of this term provinces also. When we talk about these provinces, you will see that wherever we see the structure of monarchy, in those places we see the term provinces. And when we see a republic, in those places we see the term as states. So, before independence, the states in India were known as provinces, British provinces. On the other hand, after independence, we came up with this term state. This state term is very much confusing because you will see that the constitution of India uses this term state at different level and with different meaning. For example, article 1 of Indian constitution, for example, article 12, article 36, article 368 and many more. At different places, we have used this term state differently and its meaning also changes with the, pass with the passage of the articles. Like for example, see the meaning of state under article 131 of Indian constitution. 
see the meaning of state under Article 368 of Indian Constitution. And you will see that we have been seeing a lot of differences with reference to this interpretation of the meaning of the term state. See the meaning in Article 12 of Indian Constitution and you will automatically be able to see all these dimensions. Let's come back to this uh, section of Government of India Act 1935. So if you see this Government of India Act 1935, here also we can see this parliamentary form of government. <coughs> And in this parliamentary form of government, we have to understand the concept of collective responsibility and the governor works on the aid and advice of the council of ministers headed by the chief minister or prime minister. Now the point is, if you talk about this aid and advice of the ministers, then again you have to understand that along with this aid and advice, there were a lot of discretionary power in the hands of the governor also. So, if you see this Government of India Act 1935, we will see that section 50 and the subsequent sections of this Government of India Act 1935 came up with this concept of the powers of the governor. Along with having this power of aid and advice, it also had discretionary power and some special responsibility. These dimensions, this special responsibility as well as discretionary power automatically comes up with the concept that this structure of governor was not only the constitutional head of the provinces. Along with being this constitu constitutional head, it also worked as the agent of the center. And that is why we have to see these relations with reference to the structure of India also after independence. Now the point is you can sum up <coughs> this structure of this governor in this government of India 1935 as they were uh -uh. by the Raj, of the Raj and for the Raj. This single line automatically comes up with this whole definition of the powers of the governor, the structure of the governor to this government of India 1935. That is they were by the Raj of the Raj and for the Raj. I am talking about the government of India 1935 because you will see that this 1935 which we are seeing here, this automatically became the provincial constitution also in 1947. When India became independent, we have to understand that this very government of India 1935 became this provincial constitution. And if you see this provincial constitution, we started using that obviously with some differences. A basic difference with reference to this structure of government of India 1935 can be understood from this dimension that the line which had specified with reference to this structure of the governor that they will work, this governor will work in his discretion, acting in his discretion and exercising his individual judgments. This proper provision which was there in the uh, Government of India Act 1935, it was omitted. So when we started using this provincial constitution after independence, we particularly omitted this section of this office of governor. However, the other provisions were, were there in existence. If you see the constitution of India, there are various things which have been directly taken from this government of India Act 1935, like office of governor, like distribution of power, like emergency provision and so on. So if you see these provisions, you will see that they were there in government of India Act 1935 also. Majority of the provisions of Indian constitution have been taken from this government of India Act 1935. If you move forward into this concept, we have to understand this very clearly that there were a lot of debates in this constituent assembly with reference to this structure of office of governor. The constituent assembly adopted this structure of office of governor on the lines of this government of India 1935, but it restructured itself. It reoriented the office and it did not have the same, same structure which was there in the British era. And that is why we have to understand this whole debate associated with this constituent, uh, with this office of governor in the constituent assembly. If you talk about this structure of office of governor, you have to understand this very clearly that the first thing which we need to see here is a subcommittee of the constituent assembly which consisted of B.G. Kher Sahab, K.N. Karju Sahab and P. Subba Ryan Sahab. If you talk about them, they were very eminent uh, personalities. If you talk about uh, B.G. Kher Sahab, he was the first chief minister of uh, Bombay presidency or Bombay state. And along with this, if you talk about uh, uh, Kane Karju Sahab, he, is the grand, he was the grandfather of Mr. Karju, who is Mr. Karju, who is very much popular these days. Now, the point is, if you see this commission, this commission, this sub subcommittee of the constituent assembly, especially came up with the provision that we need to have an elected governor. Now, I am specifying these dimensions because the biggest issue in the hands of the constituent assembly was with reference to two dimensions. That is, should the structure of office of governor be elected or nominated? Nominated. First dimension. The second dimension was what will be the power in the hands of the governor? Should there be any discretionary power or there should not be any discretionary power? These were the two main issues in the hands of the constituent assembly which they needed to have. And if you see this here, this subcommittee clearly recommended that there should be a elected 
governor. On the other hand, if you see this, the draft constitution which was presented in 1948, the first draft of the constitution which was presented in 1948, it did not specify clearly on the issue of this election and nomination of the governor. And it was in the hands of the constituent assembly that what they needed to have. And that is why we need to understand different leaders of that time and their opinion with reference to this structure of office of governor. For example, if you see this whole, whole, whole issue, you will see that when we talk about this structure of process of appointment, the constitution presently specifies under article 153, uh, uh, 153 of Indian constitution that there should be a governor in every state and there can also be a common governor for two or more states. If you talk about this common governor, this provision was added by 7th constitution amendment. So, this article 153 of Indian constitution needs to be understood very clearly. Along with this article 153 of Indian constitution, we also need to understand this article 155 of Indian constitution. If you see this article 155 of Indian constitution, it specifies that the governor is appointed by the president. Now, if you see this, the governor is appointed by the president. But do you know, practically it is not in the hands of the president. Practically it is in the hands of the prime minister and the council of ministers. So, they are the main bodies which appoints the governor. So, this is the current structure with reference to appointment of the governor. There are two articles which we need to understand, article 153 as well as article 155. But when you go into this debate associated with this very issue, you will see that Dr. Bhim Rao Ambedkar was very much clear with reference to this structure of office of governor. He clearly specified that when we talk about this office of governor, this office of governor comes up with very limited and nominal power. And if you see this, it is mainly ornamental. This office of governor does not have any real power. It is only ornamental. Uh, ornamental. And he also specified that there is no function of this office of governor. Office of governor does not come up with any function. It comes up with the duties. Now, Ambedkar Sahab, one of my favorite. If you talk about Dr. Bhim Rao Ambedkar Sahab, you will see that he kept on coming up with various great lines. For example, here. If you see this structure, what he specified? He specified that the office of governor does not come up with any function. It comes up with the duties. Another very important line with reference to this structure of a, with, with reference to the lines of Dr. Bhim Rambedkar Sahab is this structure with reference to this structure of democracy. When he specified that political democracy is meaningless unless and until at the base of it we have the social democracy. And he also specified the meaning of social democracy as liberty, equality and fraternity. The trinity of liberty, equality and fraternity. Let's come back to this concept again. So if you talk about this office of governor, you have to understand that Dr. Bhim Rambedkar Sahab specified that they do not have any function, they have the duties. And when you talk about these duties, these duties are to be done through this advice of the Council of Ministers. Now, this made very much clear that when we have this as ornamental, when we have limited and nominal function of this office of governor, and there is no function, there is say, uh, duties in the hands of this office of governor, and those are to be done on the aid and advice of the Council of Ministers. So, why do we need to have this election? Why do, why do we need to worry for this appointment? And that is why a lot of debate came into existence. If you see Viswanath Das, if you talk about Viswanath Das, he himself became a governor with the passage of time. He was the governor of Uttar Pradesh for uh, some period of time also. If you talk about Viswanath Das, he, he specified that if the central government comes up with this provision of a, what we call as the uh, uh, nominated or the uh, governor appointed by the president, then it may create various issues. He also specified that if we see the structure of the governor, if the governor is elected, if the governor is elected by the state government, then we also need to understand this issue of cooperation between the center and the states. The governor comes up with two main functions. Governor is head of the state, the constitutional head of the state. Along with this, we also need to understand the governor is also the representative, representative of the center in the states. So, these two dimensions needs to be understood very clearly. If you move forward into this concept, you have to understand the other issue in the assembly was with reference to this issue of appointment. And if you see this issue of appointment, you will see that post-independence, there, there was no issue with reference to this issue of appointment of governor. If you see this, till the first three general elections, that is, till 1968, there was no issue with reference to this office of governor. For the first time, we started seeing this issue of appointment after this fourth general election, which came into existence in February 1960. We saw that Congress party lost elections in eight states. 
when they lost elections in eight states then we started seeing a new type of political dynamics in india where we started seeing that in states we had some different government some regional government and in the center we had the congress government this automatically raised this issue of appointment also and that is why if you see this whole uh, um, context a demand came into existence where you will see that the state government wants to have this concurrence over the appointment of the governors presently we have the structure of consultation and this structure of consultation is also not constitutional it has been evolved with the passage of time but the state governments presently want this structure of concurrence if you see this office of governor you have to understand that is it is the balanced wheel of the central state relationship from both the dimensions both the dimensions in the, in the sense that if you talk about the first dimension what is the first dimension the first dimension is being the constitutional head of the state along with this we also need to understand that this office of governor also has this structure of representative of the center now if you see both these functions you have to understand that both these functions comes up with this balance wheel of the center state relations this balance wheel of this concept of federalism in india if you see this issues associated with this federalism you will see that there are a lot of things associated with this structure of governor also so if you move forward into this concept with reference to these things we have to understand the lines of jawaharlal nehru now the point is with reference to this process of appointment there were two options in the hands of the constituent assembly the first thing was just like the things were being done that is the governor the raj pramukh will be appointed by the president on the advice of the council of ministers headed by the prime minister and the second option was there can be the system of elections if you talk about this dimension jawaharlal nehru was very much clear that there is no need of having this elected governor because if we come up with this structure of elected governor it will automatically come up with this separate separatist provincial tendencies if the governors are elected then it will not promote this unity of the nation and if you see this ambedkar specified that whoever becomes a governor that person should be above this party politics and you will see that various committees which have suggested this structure they have also raised this very issue dr bhimra ambedkar also concurred with the views of uh, uh, jawaharlal nehru and specified that if the post of this office of governor is ornamental in nature then what is the uh, 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 relevance of spending so much of money and and effort in the election of the governor and that is why if you see this then india opted for this structure of governors being appointed by the president and not the elections however there were various personalities in the constituent assembly also who were not in support of this uh, idea for example if we talk about them then rohini kumar choudhury he clearly specified that when we talk about this structure of this uh, governor the functions or the uh, powers of the governor we have to understand two dimensions if you see the draft article 143 of the constitution this was the draft article 143 of the constitution now if you see this draft article it 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 specified clearly that the governor will work on the aid and advice of the council of ministers but along with working on the aid and advice of council of ministers it will also have some discretionary powers specified to the situations to the constitution now the term discretionary power is specified here in the draft term 143 and if you see this you can see this presently in this article 163 of indian constitution so article 163 also specifies the same thing which we had in draft 143 and that is why rohini kumar choudhury raised this question again and again that when we have this post as ornamental when we do not have any function of this structure only duties of this structure then what is the reason behind writing this term discretionary however finally the same text came into existence and if you see the structure today you will see that today also the structure of this governor is such that they work on the aid and advice of the council of ministers but along with that they also have this discretionary power specified under article 163 of indian constitution you have to understand that this discretionary power now just try to relate the discretionary power of the office of governor as well as the office of president of india just try to relate these two concepts and see the differences which we have in existing let's move forward into concept into this whole uh, structure so at the end of this whole structure if you see the debates of the constituent assembly there were two options in the hands of the uh, members of the assembly the first option if you talk about this the first option was to have a system of uh, what we call as elected governor on the other hand there was the another system where we can see this nominated government governor or the governor appointed by the president of india 
if you see these two dimensions, you will see that Canada comes up with this process of appointment of governor by the president. On the other hand, if you see USA, they comes up with this structure of election. So in USA, you will see that we have the election for the governor also. On the other hand, if you talk the if you talk about the same structure in Canada, you will see that Canada comes up with this process of appointment by the president. Now the point is, if you see these two dimensions, again you have to understand that India opted for this Canadian mo Canadian model and not the American model. These dimensions needs to be understood with reference to various structures, various constitutional structures, because in the syllabus you can see that there is a clear cut uh, 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 provision which specifies about this constitutional framework of India with different countries. How can we relate them? What are the differences? What are the similarities? And you will see that every year in examination there is a question from this dimension also. So, if you see this American model as well as Canadian model, India opted for Canadian model and not the American model. The main reasons behind opting this Canadian model can be summed up through the debates of the Constituent Assembly, which we have seen. Either it be Jawaharlal Nehru or it be Dr. Bhim Rambedkar Sahib and many more. If you see them, then the, then the whole uh, uh, provision of opting for this appointment of the office of a governor through the president can be summed up through these points. That is, Jawaharlal Nehru clearly specified that we need to have this all India unity and the structure should promote all India unity. If we have this structure of appointment of the governor through this structure of uh, president, then it will encourage this centripetal tendencies and it will help in having this all India unity. On the other hand, if we, if we do not come up with this provision, then it will automatically give us a fewer link between, between the center and the states. If the structure is elected, then automatically it will give a fewer link, link between these two. That is why we came up with this. In the same manner, we have to understand that this governor is head of the state and head of the state should be impartial. If head of the state is elected, then what will happen? This impartiality will always be in doubt because if they come up with the system of election, they will also have this party dominance. And if you have party dominance, then how can you assure that this head of the state is above this party politics, which was specified by Jawaharlal Nehru also in the uh, assembly debates. Again, if you move forward into this concept, we have to understand that we gave this power in the hands of the governor and this power was very much limited. It had very limited power, only nominal power. So if we had such a power in the hands of the governor, then what is the need of investing so much of money in this whole system? as specified by Dr. Mahim Rambedkar Sahab. And if you see these concepts, we have to understand that a elected governor will not promote this national interest. It will promote the interest of that particular state. Also, it will always give us this political uh, uh, instability if we have a elected governor. We need to understand these dimensions very clearly that there will always be a second rated man if we have the system of election because the first rated man will be the prime minister, uh, will be the chief minister and the second rated man will come up with this structure of what we call as the governor. So with keeping all these things in mind, we came up with this Canadian model and not the American model and this structure is there in existence even today also. Various committees have come up with this and all of them have raised the same issue with reference to this structure. But the point is, we have to understand the multifaceted role of this office of governor, that is the constitutional head. Obviously, it comes up with two different structures, that is being the constitutional head as well as the representative of the center. But along with that, if you see this, you will see that it works as a vital link between the center and the states and is a key functionary in the system envisaged by the constitution. When we talk about this whole structure, we have to understand these two dimensions very clearly. Along with this, we have to understand that it keeps on informing the center with reference to the affairs of the state. Whatever is happening in the state, these things, these, these dimensions are informed by the governor to the center. Because we need to understand that the center protects these states also. And it is the constitutional obligation of the center to protect these states. So, these this structure of governor obviously helps in that dimension. We have to see that there are various functions also with reference to the legislative structure of the states which are done by the governor. For example, prorogation or dissolution or summoning of the house. These are done by the governor just like we see at the center by the president. Now the point is if you see these dimensions, we also need to understand that it also assures this continuity in the system of admi administration in the state. If you see this governor, Governor is for a fixed period of time. Now, if it is for a fixed period of time, then it will be there in existence. On the other hand, if you see the chief minister, the chief ministers will come and go. 
but the governor will remain there. So if you talk about this dimension, governor will always be there and it assures that we have this continuity in this state administration. That is why we have to understand this dimension very clearly. That is the role of the office of governor. If you move forward into this concept of office of governor, you again need to understand this dimension very clearly that this office of governor, which we have been highlighting again and again here, that in the case of this president's rule under Article 356 of Indian Constitution, here also, in this dimension also, if you see this, here also, the governor works as the agent of the center and the functions are performed by the governor only through the uh, through the powers which have been transferred to it by the president, that is mainly the council of ministers headed by the prime minister. So, these can be understood as the multifaceted role of the office of governor. But the point is, there are various constitutional dimensions associated with this office of governor. And you will see these dimensions, you can understand these dimensions from Article 153 to Article 201 of Indian Constitution. Not only 201, but we also have this ordinance making power under Article 213. So, if you see these constitutional dimensions, I have just specified the articles here because I personally want that you don't need to remember all these articles, but you need to see all these articles. Just try to have a reading over all these articles. Either it be Article 156, 157, 158, 160, 167 or 200, 201, whatever provision you talk about, all these should be there. These two articles, that is Article 200 and 201, are more important. We also have this Article 213. If you talk about this Article 213, it comes up with this ordinance making power. This ordinance making power is very much important. I will not cover these dimensions here because of the limitations of the time. Now, the point is Article 200 and Article 201 of Indian Constitution needs to be understood very clearly. If you talk about this, it gives us this provision of assent of the governor. So, whenever a bill is presented to the governor, governor comes up with various options. There are some sort of options which can be done by the governor. The first thing is, it can accept the bill, it can reject the bill, it can, it can send the bill for reconsideration. And the fourth option is, if you talk about this, then it can also send the bill to the president. Now, these are the options which we see in the hands of the governor. Now, the point is, along with this reconsideration, it can also suggest the changes, which changes needs to be done. So, when a bill is presented to the governor, it comes up with these four options. When we talk about this coming up with this precedent that is keeping the bill for the assent of precedent, then here also we have various uh, provisions. If you talk about this, if the bill is changing the structure of the high court, if you talk about this structure, if the bill is talking about this changes in the structure of high court, we have to understand that any bill which endangers the structure of the high court, that bill should be reserved for the president. Along with that, there are various other bills which also needs to be reserved by the governor to the president. Now, the point is, if there is any bill which is ultra biased, that is, which is against the provisions of constitution, which goes against the provisions of constitution, then those bills should also be reserved by the governor to the president. If you move forward into this concept, then we have to understand that any bill which is against, which is opposed to the structure of DPSPs, those bills should also be reserved for this office of president. If you move forward into this concept, then which is against the larger interest of the country or against this uh, 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 structure of national, if there is anything which is with reference to this national importance, if you move forward, then if there is any bill which is with reference to Article 31 capital A, that is acquisition of property with reference to this structure, then that bill should also be reserved for the assent of the president. So, overall, if you see this structure, the there is one provision which is very which needs to be understood very clearly. That is, if there is anything which endangers the position of the state high court, that bill should be reserved for the assent of the president. But along with this, these dimensions needs to be understood. When we talk about these dimensions, then there is an addition of these provisions which we need to understand from the dimension of Article 201 of Indian Constitution. So, 200 specifies about what, what the president will do, what, what the governor will do. On the other hand, Article 201 of Indian Constitution specifies about what the president will do with reference to the bills which are reserved by the governor to, for the president. So, here it is specified that president can obviously give assent, withhold the assent, or send it for reconsideration. There are three options which are there in the hands of the president. Obviously, not in the case of money bill. There are different, different provisions in the case of money bill, which we will see separately in the section of money bill. I am not specifying it here because with reference to money bill also, there are various limitations. So, if you see the 
uh, ascent power of the governor and the president you will see that it depends on the types of bills with reference to constitutional amendment bill there is no veto power in the hands of the president but with reference to constitutional amendment bill there will there is nothing in the hands of the governor because whenever we talk about this structure of constitutional amendment we have to understand that this constitutional amendment can only be done by the president uh, this constitutional amendment finally can only be approved by the president that is it is initiated by the parliament in some cases there can be the role of a state uh, state legislature but ultimately the assent is given by the president so in the case of constitutional amendment there is nothing in the hands of the governor with reference to money bill it can either give the assent or reject it it cannot send it for reconsideration so these dimensions needs to be understood very clearly but the point is if you talk about this office of governor we have to understand that the role has been interpreted by supreme court in various judgments if you talk about this supreme court and its structure you have to understand for the first time in 1952 this office of governor started coming into news 1952 after the elections if you see the structure then you will see that in this undivided madras we are, i'm talking about that phase when this madras was not divided in that phase if you, if you if you see the structure you will see that this united democratic front was uh, coming up with this provision with, with the uh, condition that they are the largest party and so and so they should form the government at that time the governor of that state was sri praksa and if you see then through this whole power in the hands of the governor, the Congress government came into existence under which we saw Rajaji as the chief minister. Now the point is we have to understand this structure very clearly because from here onwards we started seeing this issue and today also we have been seeing this issue. I will uh, show you with reference to various examples. Now the point is if you see this whole structure you will see that from here onwards this structure has started coming into existence but the biggest issue came in 1967 as i had specified earlier also when the congress party lost in eight states and from here onwards this issue started being raised again and again and again and again and if you see this issue you will see that one of the discretionary powers of the governor is with reference to this president's rule submitting report with reference to this president's rule and you will see that till 1994 we had seen more than 100, 100 instances of president's rule why am i specifying this 1994 because from here onwards we came up with this sr bomai case i'll just explain this sr bomai case also and that is why you will see that from here onwards we started seeing some limitation associated if you move forward into this concept then another important judgment came with reference to this structure in shamsir singh versus the state of punjab 1974 if you see this it is specified that the president as well as the governor if you talk about this these two structures we have to understand that this president as well as the governor they work on the aid and advice of the ministers and there are there are some exceptional cases where they do not work on the aid and advice of the structure but we have to understand that there are only some exceptional cases where they do not work on the aid and advice of this structure otherwise they work on the aid and advice of the structure and if you talk about this whole structure we have to understand this very clearly that whenever we talk about this structure of president on governors they have to do, do the same thing the constitutional functions which have been specified the constitutional powers which have been specified if you move forward into this concept then sr bomai judgment of 1950, 1994 becomes very much important because it is specified that president's rule, president's rule shall only be uh, 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 applied in the event of this breakdown of constitutional mach machinery along with this structure we have to understand that in no other situation we should see this structure of president's rule and that is why you will see that after this sr bomai judgment of 1994 a decrease in this president's rule came into existence before this phase of 1994 that is sr bomai judgment we had been seeing a lot of uh, president's rule i had specified earlier also that there had been more than 100 instances of this president's rule so if you talk about this structure you have to understand this very clearly that it is specified that only in the case of breakdown of constitutional machinery we should come up with this structure of president's rule and in no other way we see we, we need to see this structure of president's rule if you move forward into this case the, into this uh, whole issue of the interpretation by the judiciary we have to understand that the judiciary is specified in this sp single case of 2010 that whenever we talk about this structure of the uh, uh, president's power to remove the governor we need to understand that it should not be done in this arbitrary or unreasonable manner 
if it is being done in arbitrary or unreasonable manner then it is not a good thing for this healthy democracy we have to understand that this power obviously they are they, they if you if you see this structure this power to remove the uh, the governor is in the hands of the president obviously on the uh, um, aid and advice of the council of ministers but we have to understand that this whole issue needs to be seen with reference to this reasonableness as well as this as well as it should not be arbitrary if you talk about this dimension you have to understand this very clearly that there have been various instances for example this whole stance started coming from 1967 if you see these dimensions you have to understand that in 1967 this whole issue started coming into existence because various parties started coming into existence and you will see that this started increasing with the passage of time like in the period of emergency or it be after the phase of emergency or it be in 1989 when BP, no. when the government uh, um, came into existence, we have to understand that in 1989 also, the Prime Minister of that time gave a letter to the President that removed all the governors. Again, if you move forward, then this kept on happening. Whenever the power started changing at the center, then this whole issue started coming into existence. We saw it various number of times, either it be 2004 or it be 1989 or it be in the phase of emergency and post-emergency period. That is why if you see this whole issue in BP single case, it was specified that the president should not remove them arbitrarily or in unreasonable manner. If you see the uh, uh, deciphering, then in Nabam Rabia judgment of 2016 also, you can see this whole issue. If you talk about this Nabam Rabia judgment, you have to understand that it limited the uh, uh, discretion of the uh, governor. With reference to this whole structure, we have to understand that it is specified that whenever we talk about this discretion of the governor, this discretion of the governor should not be arbitrary or fanciful. This discretion, this discretion of the governor should be reasonable. Another very important issue with reference to this office of governor is government of NCT of Delhi versus Union of India. And you will say that we do not have the structure of governors in the NCT of Delhi. And that is why I have particularly mentioned this case also. Because we have to understand that whenever we talk about the judgments, whenever we talk about the structures, we have to understand that what is the structure of governor in Delhi and what are the powers in the hands of the governor in Delhi. Again, one more thing we need to understand. If you talk about the governors, we have to understand that the governor appoints the chief minister. But what is the structure with reference to this national capital of the uh, uh, territory of Delhi? And these dimensions needs to be understood because here you will see that we have LG. Now, just try to relate this LG with the powers which we have in the hands of governor. These dimensions needs to be understood very clearly because you will see that through these dimensions only, we have been seeing a lot of conceptual questions. Just try to see that just like the governors appoint the chief minister, do you think that the LGs also appoint the chief minister of Delhi? Who has appointed Arvind Kejriwal? Now, let's move forward into this concept. So, these are some of the uh, uh, interpretations made by the judiciary. If you see this whole issue of the office of governor, you will see that there has been a lot of spat between this Raj Bhavan as well as the elected government. If I talk about the concept of Raj Bhavan, it means the uh, Raj Pramukh or the governor. Now, the point is, if you see this, there have been a lot of issues between this Raj Bhavan as well as the elected government. And you will see that the roles, powers, discretions of the governor, uh, the office of the governor has been raised again and again because of various 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 issues we have been seeing these things and if we talk about these issues then we have to see that what are the current issues which are there in existence if we talk about the current issues you have to understand this as the first issue is with reference to appointment of governors. if you talk about this structure of appointment of governors you have to understand that this post of governor has mainly become a retirement package for the politicians now when you see this it mainly comes up with this retirement package and it automatically raises this issue of impartiality and not non-partitionship because we had been specifying through this debates of the constituent assembly that this structure of the office of governor should be non-partition should be impartial but when the politicians themselves are becoming the governors then the politicians obviously were from any political party and it will automatically raise this party interest and that is why if you see this appointment issue, you will see that there have been various instances also where CM is not consulted. Now, there is no constitutional obligation with reference to this, but we have come up with a healthy practice through which we have been saying this system. Another very important issue is with reference to tenure under the discretion of the center. 
Now, the point is, if you talk about this tenure under the discretion of the center, you have to understand this very clearly that uh, the constitution provides for the five-year period. But there is no removal process and the center can call them anytime. Also, there is no removal process also. And do you know, a line is said again and again that uh, removing a central government employee is tougher than removing the governor. So, it is much easier to remove a governor than, than removing a central government, central government employee because Article 311 of Indian Constitution comes up for safeguarding the central government employees. On the other hand, if you see this structure, you have to understand this very clearly that there is no such provision in the hands of the governor. So, governor can be removed any time, but on the other hand, a central government employee Removing a central government employee needs a lot of safe, um, there, there are a lot of safeguards for removing the central government employees. That is why this issue of appointment as well as tenure under the discretion of the center and the removal comes up in existence again and again. If you move forward into this concept, again, there is this issue of misuse of discretionary power. If you talk about this misuse of discretionary power, you, we need to understand that the office of governor comes up with this provision of appointment also. So, it appoints various uh, 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 posts and if you talk about this post, you have to understand that this is done through consultation by the central, with the state government. But there have been various instances where we have not seen this consultation. For example, in 2018, we saw this issue in Tamil Nadu where vice chancellors were appointed without consulting the uh, state government. Again, if you see this uh, whole issue, there is also one more discretion with reference to this issue of when hung assembly comes into existence. So, what needs to be done in the case of hung assembly is also a very, very serious issue. If you talk about this structure of hung assembly, you have to understand this very clearly. So, if you talk about this structure of hung assembly, you have to understand this very clearly that what needs to be done in the case of hung assembly or what needs to be done, whom to be called for appointing the chief minister, which political party. And you can see the issues in 2017 in Goa or Manipur or in Karnataka. We have seen a lot of examples. Whom to call for this, uh, for appointing the chief minister and what time period should be given for proving the majority. If you see this whole structure, you have to understand that. The, the, the basic provision is that the largest party or alliance should be called. But we have seen, and, and this discretion is in the hands of the governor. And we have seen it various number of times with reference to this whole structure. Again, if you move forward, then there is one more issue of this office of governor. It has been raised again and again that they function as an agent of political party. And we saw recently that a, a governor was charged with reference to this model code of conduct. Now, just try to understand if a constitutional head is being charged with reference to model code of conduct, then it will automatically raise this whole issue. If you see this, then reservation of bill for the president is also a very serious issue because it automatically halts the whole structure of the uh, lawmaking. And you will see that various committees have recommended various provisions associated with this also. Obviously, I am talking here about Article 201 of Indian Constitution. So, let us see these provisions one by one. Again, if you see, then we have been seeing a lot of interference in day-to-day -day administration also. And the biggest example with reference to this is what we saw in West Bengal. In West Bengal, we saw a lot of issues associated with uh, a lot of issues in this day-to-day -day administration. If you move forward into this, then we have also seen that government is acting more as an agent of the center and less as the constitutional head. If you talk about this dimension, then if the government, if the governor is acting as an agent of the central government, it will automatically raise the issues, the issues of, or it will automatically raise the interest of the central government and it will automatically raise this issue of center state relations also. We have been seeing this issue of rise of this agent of the center at various places and this automatically, this is mainly seen at those places where we have the different government at the center and the states. In those places, we see it more often. If you see this, then we have to understand that in the case of recommendation of the president's rule also, it is a discretionary power. But in this discretionary power, if you see this, we have seen a lot of cases where it has not been given in proper interest. Like in 2016 in Arunachal Pradesh, this president's rule was recommended, which was not necessary there. There have been various examples associated with this, even after this SR Bamai case. Before this Bamai case, there were more instances, but after this Bamai case, this instance started decreasing. Again, 
there is a very big issue with reference to this office of governor if you talk about this office of governor you have to understand that there is no significant function in the structure of the governor and if you see this it automatically raises this issue of this mere rubber stamp however you guys should not use these terms like rubber stamp and these things we have to understand that these obviously do not give respect to the constitutional structure but if you see this in reality this is turning out to be a rubber stamp because there is no significant function i am specifying this again that please avoid using these types of uh, terms in your answer sheet so these are some of the things these are some of the current issues which we have been saying with reference to this office of government now we need to understand that what reforms should be taken what we need to do with reference to this structure of office of government when we talk about these reforms, when we need to see that what needs to be done, then obviously various commissions and committees will come into this thing. If you talk about various commissions and committees, you have to understand the first thing with reference to this whole structure is Sarkaria Commission. If you see the Sarkaria Commission, then the Sarkaria Commission came into existence in 1983. And after some period of time, it submitted its report in 1988. Now the point is this Sarkaria Commission specified various things but the most important thing which we need to see here is with a reference to this structure of the office of governor and it specified some very uh, basic provisions very, very basic provisions in the sense that it specified that whenever we talk about this office of governor we, we, has, we saw a question with reference to this also in prelims uh, 2019 there was a question with a reference to this very structure that a, which of the following committees recommended, uh, recommended this and the answer of that was Sarkaria Commission. Now the point is if you see this then Sarkaria Commission clearly, clearly specified that whenever we talk about this appointment of a person as a governor we have to understand that where we have different political party in the center and the states then in those places no political representative or no person who was there in politics should be appointed in this structure of this governor. It was very much clear with this because it is specified that whenever we talk about this whole issue, then the whole issue comes into existence because of this very reason. Now the point is, if you talk about this Sarkaria Commission, it also came up with various other provisions. Like it is specified that whenever we talk about this, then the person should be a detached outsider and a person of eminence in some walk of life. It is specified that whenever we talk about this governor, then, the, then a retiring governor should, should be debarred from any office of profit. Whenever we talk about this, then whoever is retired as a governor they should not have hold any office of profit and if you move forward into this then with reference to 356 also it is specified that it should be used with various limitations if you talk about the commissions then another important thing is recommendation of the committee of governors in 1971 this recommendation of the committee of governors was uh, came into existence which was appointed by president Giri. now if you talk about this it also specified that the governor has its own functions laid down in the constitution and when it has its own functions laid down in the constitution then in no sense it is an agent of the president if it is not an agent of the president we have to understand this dimension very clearly it was specified by committee of governors a very important provision and if you see this then it is specified that the governor should function on the provisions of the constitution and not as an agent of the central government so if you move forward into this then another important commission which we need to see is this punchi commission if you talk about this structure of Punchi Commission, the recommendations of the Punchi Commission, which submitted its report in 2010, then it clearly specified with reference to this whole structure that whenever we talk about this structure of the uh, Office of Governor, we have to understand that uh, it is expected to be independent and to act in a manner devoid in any devoid of any political consideration, and which simply means that. It should not shield the central government and it should not become a shield of the central government also. Again, if you talk about this whole structure, it should work on the advice of the Council of Ministers, except where we have this discretionary uh, provisions. Along, uh, apart from this discretionary provisions, which is there, which is situational as well as at some places required, along with uh, apart from those conditions, at all other at all at all other places, it should work. So this advice of the Council of Ministers, this Sarkari, this Punchi Commission came up with various other provisions associated with this. Punchi Commission specified very clearly that there should be a fixed tenure of this office of governor along with this impeachment process. If you talk about this, there is no such impeachment pro uh, process. The constitution specifies about the term impeachment only with reference to this office of president that is under article 61 of Indian constitution. At no other place we have seen this term impeachment. 
if you move forward then with reference to bills also it is specified that within six months the bills should be signed by the president if you move forward into this then it also is specified that we need to streamline the role of governor with respect to the constitutional provisions only and whenever we talk about this whole structure we have to see this on the basis of the constitutional provisions it also came up with various guidelines provisions of the guidelines with reference to this appointment of the chief uh, uh, appointment of the governor uh, appointment of the chief minister by the governor it was raised again and again that at various instances we saw that the without being the largest party the political party came up with this uh, structure of the chief minister and that is why it was specified that party with widest widest support or if there is any pre poll alliance or a coalition then those parties should be treated as a single political party and these parties should be appointed for this whole structure again if you talk about this then there are various other uh, committees and commissions which we need to see like recommendation given by national commission to review the working of the constitution it clearly specified that whenever we talk about the appointment of the governor then this appointment of governor should come up with this concept of a committee and this committee should consist of the prime minister the home minister the uh, speaker of the lok sabha and the chief minister of the concerned state so whenever we have to appoint uh, uh, a governor it should come up with this structure of this committee it was specified by the national commission to review the working of the constitution if you talk about this national commission to review the working of the constitution it also specified about this concept of tenth schedule it is specified that pre poor alliance or coalition should be treated as one political party and whenever it is about anti defection law that is 10th schedule added by 52nd constitutional amendment we have to understand that this pre poll alliance or coalition should be treated under this 10th schedule so if we see any defection through this system then it should be treated as uh, uh, it should be treated under this anti defection law again if you move forward then we have to see the recommendations made by the second arc also which submitted its report in 2005 it clearly specified that whenever we talk about this appointment of uh, uh, a governor we have to understand that the person who had a long experience of public life and administration those person should be appointed and not on the basis of this political uh, background if you see this it also specified that a person who becomes a governor there should not be any further appointment appointment of that person as a governor and no judges should also come here this has also raised this issue of appointment of judges as the governor it is specified that no judges should become uh, if you see this it is specified that whenever we talk about the judges no judges should become a governor unless and until these judges also became the legislators if the judges became the legislature came in the came as a part of the legislature after retirement in that case we can see them as the governor but not in any other case and whenever we talk about the appointment of the governors we have to understand that it should come up with this consultation of the cm this uh, second arc also specified that interstate council you guys know with through uh, on the basis of which commission this interstate council came into existence just try to see these dimensions we have seen those commissions here now the point is interstate council it also specified that this interstate council should come up with guidelines with reference to discretionary power because the biggest issue with reference to this structure of the governor is this discretionary power and so we have to see this very clearly these were specified by second arc the point is these all these recommendations if you see some of the recommendations are being accepted partially and some of them are being accepted completely also unless and until we see these uh, recommendations unless and until we bring the reforms unless and until we start solving the conflicting issues between the center and the states with reference to this structure of governor we will have issues with reference to this structure of federalism because as i had specified earlier also that this structure of governor works as the wheel of this fiscal federalism uh, wheel of this say, federal structure of india and that is why this needs to be emphasized there are certain facts associated with this office of governor also which i want to specify if we talk about these facts we have to understand this fact like who was the first indian to become a governor do you know in 1909 for the first time an indian became a part of executive council of this governor general or the executive council of the viceroy of india this was the first time when an indian became the person was satendra prasad sinha if you talk about sp sinha sahab he also became the first advocate general of bengal if you talk about uh, satendra prasad sinha sahab he also became the first indian to become a governor he became the governor of bihar and odisha now the point is if you see the provisions associated with sp sinha sahab there is a long list he became the president of indian national congress in 1915 
he also got the title of sir now if you talk about sp sinha sahab just try to have some uh, research on sp sinha sahab also again if you move forward then we also need to understand that who was the first governor of india please go through these facts who was the first uh, who was the first women governor of india if you talk about this uh, first women governor of india just see from which state she belongs again if you see there are various uh, instances where we have been seeing that governors are becoming the president also for example the present uh, the, the present uh, governor uh, the present the president uh, the present president of india murmu ma'am if you talk about her she was also the governor of a state before this govind sahab before that uh, pradhya patil so if you see there are various examples where we have seen that the uh, president of india earlier served as the governor so these dimensions needs to be understood again if you talk about this whole dimension associated with this concept of governor there are various things which i have not covered it specifically here specifically because of lack of time if you talk about this whole structure i have to specify that we have to see the privileges which are there in the hands of the governor along with this privileges we have to understand this comparison of president and governor in different aspect that is either it be the veto power either it be the ordinance power and uh, various other dimensions again we have to see this ordinance making power of governor also we have to understand this pardoning power now this pardoning power can also be related with this president we have to see the powers and functions and terms of office i have not specifically mentioned these things because of lack of time as this is a demo class and we have to submit this in a time frame manner also along with this when we talk about this office of governor just try to understand whenever you see the questions in examination you will see that the questions in examination the current trend of the questions in examinations are somewhat different somewhat different in the sense that you will see that the current trends which we have been seeing is mainly with <coughs> mainly with reference to the themes which are there in existence so see the themes and go through the static portion of those things whenever see you you are seeing a news associated with this governor you have to understand that you only need to see the current issue current theme and then relate it with the static portion this is what we need to have the approach with reference to this whole structure till then all of you thank you bye bye